Hello and welcome back for another episode of the Newbie Dentist Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Omid Azami. It is a special episode for me today as I'm announcing a sponsorship agreement between the Newbie Dentist Podcast and Henry Schein. Henry Schein have been kind enough to be the first sponsors on board supporting the Newbie Dentist Podcast. And with their help and support, I plan on growing the podcast improving the quality, improving the frequency, and getting access to better and better guests to provide you guys, the listeners, the maximum value. Henry Schein is the leading distributor for dental practices in Australia. With over 60,000 products, they cover everything, guys. Consumables, CAD cam, equipment, lab equipment, and anything in the specialty fields. You can always rely on them to be your trusted business partner every step of the way. In this week's episode, I sat down with Dr. Clarence Tam out of New Zealand to talk about her dental journey. Dr. Tam is originally from a suburb of Toronto, Richmond Hill, and actually went to my alma mater, the University of Western Ontario, for both her undergrad and dental school. She then completed a one-year GPR at the prestigious SickKids Hospital in Toronto prior to moving down to New Zealand to start working in private practice. She is a CPD junkie and became the first AACD accredited dentist in New Zealand, which is an incredible accomplishment. She is also about to finish the COIS modules and is someone who's really made a lasting impression on me when it comes to dental education and the pursuit of excellence. Dr. Tam is also heavily involved in teaching and runs Sculpting School 101, a hands-on anterior and posterior composite workshop, which she does in New Zealand, Australia, and soon to be in the United States, I believe. Since recording this podcast, the impression and raging reviews that Dr. Tam gave to me about COIS really convinced me and I've actually signed up myself. So I'm heading over there in December, which I'm super excited about. As always, if you guys enjoy these podcasts, please be sure to pass them on to your friends, classmates, and colleagues. It does make a big difference to growing the community and getting the bigger exposure and helping more and more dentists achieve their their goals. If you're a longtime listener, I just want to thank you again. If you have a minute, please head over to iTunes and just give us a a, a rating or a a review. It does help us in the rankings on iTunes and get better exposure as well. Without further delay, I hope you guys enjoyed this great interview with Dr. Clarence Tam. Hello and welcome to the Newbie Dentist Podcast, the safe place for newbie dentists to connect, collaborate, learn, and grow. The Newbie Dentist Podcast aims to provide high-quality and high-value content for all the newbie dentists out there. With your host, Dr. Omer Azami. So normally how I like to kind of start these things off is kind of just get into a bit of an origin story and like talk about your background and everything. So if you can just kind of take me back where I started, like why you chose to do dentistry and kind of uh, the journey you've been on so far. That'd be great. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Um, so pretty much in grade 12, <laughs> yawn, um, in grade 12, I decided I really liked uh, microbiology. And yeah. I was like, hey, you know, what are the coolest professions to be? Because, you know, I, I guess you start seriously thinking about your future at around, um, you know, grade 12 or so. Yeah. So at around yeah. grade 12, I was like, oh, yeah, you know, like a microbiologist would be cool. You know, you wear a lab coat and you like kind of like fight <laughs> disease. Yeah. And so, yeah, like I, like I thought that was awesome. And then um, in grade 13, I had to do a, a project for OAC. Uh, at that time, it was just called OAC, but I think it's like grade 13. Yeah. Um, and pretty much I chose my project to be on periodontal pathogens, right? Like <laughs> actinobacillus, actinobacillus, yeah. comatum, and porphyrmonus gingivalis. And um, I, I remember kind of being like really kind of like, enthralled by the feeling of being at the U of T library, you know, just yeah. like in there, just like feeling like I was a student, but I wasn't, you know, yeah. and I was obviously like way too young to kind of like, you know, be like a demo student. That's but, a beautiful library. It's huge there at uh, uh, that main library that they have. Yeah. So like the journal periodontology just like went through that and, you know, not, not that I got the highest mark on the paper or anything like that, but it certainly did spark an interest for me. And I was like, oh, you can get the best of both worlds. You know, you can, you can be like a, a microbiologist and you can be like a dentist because I hear yeah. dentists are rich, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so um, you know, like, so during my undergrad, I, like, I knew that I had to um, pretty much get my energy and had to get some pretty decent marks and stuff like that. Um, so I did my undergrad in microbiology and immunology, right? Yeah. And, Where did you go for your undergrad? Western. Western yeah. as well. Okay, nice. Wow. Well, what residence were you in in first year? Westminster College. Okay, nice. Because I went to Western for undergrad, so I did kin there. 
job. Oh, you did Kinder. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And yeah. and so, which college did you stay at? Um, I was at Perth Hall. Um, it probably Perth wasn't Hall. around. It was, it was pretty new. It's I think new so it may not have been yeah. there when you were there. Yeah. yeah. So so I was pretty much um like I stayed in residence halls like a lot of years that I was there. Second year Delaware, third year Delaware Hall. Yeah. Fourth year I think Lambton Hall. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then like first year dentistry. Um, was that Lamp- no, sorry, sorry. The one on University Drive coming in through those cool gates are, I think it's called El- Elgin Hall. Elgin Hall, yeah. yeah. Like before yeah. the bridge? Yeah. Yeah, before the bridge. Yeah. yeah. So I stayed at Elgin Hall for fourth year. And then first year dentistry, I decided I was going to be a more grown up. And I stayed at Lambton Hall, which was okay. more apartment style living. Yeah. Um, so that that was pretty cool. Um, you know, it was close to the dental school. It was It was great. I mean... Yeah, so Western was a really, really good experience for me. And um, during my interview um, to get into Western, they're like, why do you want to be a dentist? I'm like, you know, everyone, you know, I'm sure says like something similar, but I said pretty much it's the perfect fusion of science, art, and business for me. Yeah, nice. <laughs> and it's, it's that trio that essentially keeps me so captivated because yeah. like, you're not just a lab rat, you know, like you're not just like, you know, like you're dealing with people. And for me, it's weird because I'm actually not naturally an extrovert at all. I'm not even calling myself like an extrovert, but yeah. um, I've had to kind of grow extrovert tendencies. Mm-hmm. So I guess I'm what you call an omnivert. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so yeah, like, like I did dentistry, obviously. And then after that, you know, I decided to do GPR because, you know, being like an Asian overachiever, I guess that's <laughs> one of the things that you kind of have to do. Yeah. Um, and were you at uh, Mount Sinai or uh, Sunnybrook? Or did you do the children's? Where did you end up doing your uh, GPR? I did it at yeah. I did okay, it at yeah. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, so it was really, really cool. But I still got to see the likes of Sandor, you know, and, and, and things like that. And, you know, his yeah. crew rolling through there. And I used to think, man, that guy's so smart. He makes so much money. He's got all the <laughs> residents kind of working for him and stuff. And I did see some really cool things. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like, like, like my favorite attendings there were obviously, you know, there was like a... Ed Barrett, uh, Michael Cassis, mm-hmm. and and of course Sandor, Sandor, and um, Robert Carmichael as well, the prosthodontist. Okay. And just yeah. watching, and just watching like Robert Carmichael work because we had to rotate through um, the McMillan Center, the Bloor McMillan Center, mm-hmm. uh, which was you know a center for special needs um, at the time. And you know, watching Robert kind of work and you know do like twelve unit uh, twelve unit impressions. Yeah. Like. You know, First try was very inspiring. Yeah. So, so, did like, you, you know, so when you were going through dental school, did you have any like thoughts or plans of like specializing at all? Or you kind of knew all along that you wanted to? Like... Not really. I mean, like I knew that I really, you know, was good at working with kids, but I also mm-hmm. knew at the same time it really scared the shit out of me. You know, it yeah. was um, it's one of those like really rewarding type of, it's like the most rewarding type of dentistry, right? I mean, like recently I, um, you know, like I, but like they're, they're doing a spotlight on me, um, for dental Asia, which is this magazine. Oh, nice. Um, and, 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 and pretty much they said, Hey, look, you know, share some cool cases with us. You're most complex. And it wasn't about, Hey, you know, watch how I plan this, you know, with DSD or watch how I execute it. Cause you know, that's just essentially blowing your own horn, but it was actually about, Oh, how I actually didn't end up drilling on this one kid because I actually used a non-invasive protocol to get rid of his brown and white spot lesions and for me that's like the most rewarding because not only did he give me like kind of um you know like like an oscar you know this is fake oscar for like you know best dentist in the world yeah (laughs) but but the guy yeah he stopped getting teased at school yeah so for me that's actually really special that's really cool so that for me is like the most rewarding type of dentistry yeah it scares me the most it gets my heart rate racing the most but um and like in terms of changing a person to be like like yeah like you know like yeah, like I try to do as as like as beautiful um, restorative work as possible. But at, at the end of the day, you know, like I do this work on a lot of people that are nervous. You know, mm-hmm. there is there's a lot of fear in dentistry. Yeah, and this is strange from you know back in the day in New Zealand they say like like the murder house, which is essentially <laughs> the school dental service, um, yeah. which is absolutely totally different these days because I know some dental therapists and they are probably better than a lot of dentists that I know mm-hmm. in terms of sculpting, in terms of their, res- their ability to create beautiful restorations. Um, so I think it's a pretty level playing field. So, so yeah, I mean, like I, yeah, like I like working with kids. Like, do I work with kids anymore? 
not really only like the special cases because yeah. you know like my life is kind of stressful enough and I <laughs> kind of just yeah would, would prefer not to kind of like stress myself out every single day to a certain level but I have you know like mad respect for those pediatric dentists that actually yeah, are at the cold face every yeah, single day I, uh, yeah. I struggle I struggle seeing kids as well I just it's very the unpredictability is like quite stressful for me because like some kids are like really good and you'll just get in and you can do the work and you can get out. Um, and then there's other cases where you're kind of running late and then your books kind of like your schedule is kind of falling apart and they're not happy and you're not happy. So it is one of those things that I, yeah, I respect a lot of like the people who are like really patient with pediatrics and, and they can you know do that yeah, day yeah, day yeah, out. Yeah. It's uh, really yeah. amazing. So when you finished your um, GPR year as sick kids, sort of what happened? Did you like enter private practice in, in Toronto or did you plan, did you move or what was that like afterwards? Um, so I worked full time <laughs> while I was in GPR. So whenever I was not on call, um, yeah. call is such a fun thing. You know, back in the day, we got a pager. Yeah. and stuff and then like you know you used to go to the bar after work and then you're like oh man you know you're a little bit buzzed slightly <laughs> but then you get paged and you're thinking oh my god i hope it's nothing ma massive yeah and um, you know, fortunately everything you know went to plan yeah. um but yeah like i i was working at uh as an associate at a private practice in scarborough mm -hmm. the corner of kennedy and Ellesmere. yeah and um yeah for, for gilbert chan and his wife, I can't remember her name. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, like really, really nice people. I, you know, like I had my first en like endo perforation there. Um, yeah. And yeah, like lots of good memories. And my first denture, my first partial denture was actually um, a partial denture that the Jamaican guy asked me to put a gold tooth on there, a gold pontic. So yeah. that, was, that was pretty wicked. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's good memories. And then as soon as I finished the GPR, then I decided in September 2015, uh, 20, 2005, actually, to, to leave for New Zealand. So um, what, brought, what brought, that, brought that on for you? It was like a huge change. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like growing up in Richmond Hill and everything, my parents were really cool. I mean, yeah. sorry, they weren't really cool. They were like, <laughs> maybe, like, like they, they tried to be cool, but they're like really kind of like, you know, um, like, like I felt like I was really sheltered. Yeah. So I felt like I needed to grow up and I, and I felt I needed to kind of like stand my own two feet. So the plan was to come over to Auckland. And the reason why Auckland instead of Melbourne, which I loved, or like Sydney, yeah. um, you know, like a group of friends and I had decided, hey, look, you know, we're all going to like end up in Sydney together. It's going to be awesome. And then uh, the, so one went to Taiwan mm -hmm. uh, first, uh, I don't know, on the way down. And then I went to Auckland because yeah. I needed to do two years before I could have unrestricted access to Australia. Mm -hmm. And then after two years, of course, you know, like he's still yeah, in Taiwan. And then, you know, like he decided to like have kids. Yeah. And then like, of course, I'm, I'm stuck in Auckland and everything. Not stuck in Auckland. It was great. As soon as you put down roots, it's very, very hard to, yeah. to move that through, especially once you have a patient base that's like really loyal and asking, you know. And of course, um, my main concern was that I would be isolated from the world. But as you know, with modern... Um, modern technology, you know, like it, it, it's, you know, it's just like you're in the next room yeah. or something like that, you know, like there, yeah. there really is no difference at all. I mean, I could be in Newmarket, Ontario yeah. you, or like Newmarket, Auckland, and it's exactly the same. It doesn't change much yet. Yeah. It doesn't change much. And it's like, you think about that expanse of ocean. That's just insane. That's yeah. just like a, it's a lot of ocean and it's really clear. I mean, mm -hmm. well, for me anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, that was, I came over and, um, you know, I got away from my parents and, you know, like I grew up, my parents grew up, you know, yeah. and then, and then now, now they can stay with me for, you know, like months on end and, and, you know, we don't argue once. I mean, like I still go to church with them, um, you know, not, not to make them happy, but to make them happy and stuff like that. But it's just like, you know, a semblance of normalcy for them. And it's, uh, That's really cool. yeah. how often do they, uh, do they come over and visit? Because I haven't they been able to convince here. my parents to come to Melbourne yet. They're, they're pretty scared of the flight. <laughs> there's nothing really to convince. I mean, from Vancouver, yeah. they go straight, right? Uh, there's a direct flight to Melbourne? Uh, from uh, Vancouver, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 14 hours, roughly. That's, that's yeah. not too bad. I mean, yeah. 14 hours, you know, what you could do, like, they could get, like, a Valium or two, yeah. you know, and just, like... <laughs> just have a nice sleep. Yeah. Off it out. yeah, exactly. And just time it so that maybe it's, like, the last thing at night... Um, okay, like the flight from Toronto to Vancouver, um, lands are kind of like, you know, late afternoon. And then like, you know, they have a few hours to chill out before getting on this like yeah. midnight flight from Vancouver to Melbourne. And usually you get here early in the morning. 
yeah, so that's decent. Then they would have slept the night with the help of Valium, yeah. of course. Yeah, I got to come them. <laughs> yeah, like definitely not Hypnovel or Midazolam because they want to remember everything. Just in case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of stuff goes on with that. Okay. yeah right. so tell me a little bit I, I mean recently with my podcast and because it's something that i'm going through like in my i, I graduated in 2016 so i'm just you know just about like two and two years and change out of school i worked in canada for a year when i first graduated so i've had some moving around as well so i've kind of you know a few months here and there that i've kind of not working what's like when in your obviously because you have a pretty accomplished dental career now that you're you know you've been out for like 10 or so years when in that process did like these decisions come to be like, okay, I'm going to commit to like CPD. I'm going to commit to these like structured programs and licensures and things like the AACD and stuff. Um, when did that come for you in your like kind of career arc? Well, for me, I mean, like I came to New Zealand and I did everything from surgicals to like, I dabbled in ortho, the growth orthodontics, you know, this non-extraction business of like growing beautiful faces with your smile, proper lip support, um, proper airways and everything like that, which is all great. Um, but then it's kind of like, you know, like I, I found out that I couldn't finish cases as beautifully as some of my orthodontic colleagues. And so I, I was a little bit dissatisfied with that. Um, then I took a look at my strengths in terms of, you know, what I was good at and, you know, like I was good at detail. Um, but the problem was with, with, I guess like with materials, my old bosses were unwilling to invest the capital and the equipment that I required to kind of do the type of work that I wanted. So um, I bounced from one, well, I bounced from one practice to the other, to the other. Um, and that third practice was a, was a practice in, in Ponsonby, Auckland. Ponsonby, Auckland's a pretty, pretty Ponsonby place. It's pretty, yeah. pretty fancy. Um, and this was back in 07. Um, and that's where I gained like a lot of exposure to cutting cutting preps for like full, full mouth rehabs and everything. Mm -hmm. And of course, no doubt along the way, you know, there's a, like a lot of carnage and, 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 and like things like that. Cause you know, like as your, as your learning curve develops, of course you have to practice on someone. Yeah. It's like, I was fortunate to, to have had that exposure. And then um, as I did more and more, I became pickier and pickier. And then um, I moved from that practice to like to one where I kind of learned some composite skills mm -hmm. and with composite, I've, like, like to me, composite dentistry is probably the most accurate representation of cosmetic dentistry because all the variables are within your control. All the variables are within your grasp. You're in charge of everything from planning through to execution. Mm -hmm. And the onus falls on you. That weight falls on your shoulders. So it is a great sense of, you know, um, I guess like stress, but also yeah, relief and exhilaration when you actually do pull off a case yeah. like that. Because you're not relying so, on the lab tech to like make the beautiful ceramic and stuff for you. Like it's all in exactly. your hands of how you're doing the shades, how you're doing the texturing, everything. Exactly. And, and, and like even in the early days, you know, like I, you know, didn't necessarily plan digital smell design because DSD didn't come out till a few years later. But um, I always planned with kind of like, you know, like I did my own um, diagnostic wax up. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so so not out of wax though. You know, you 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 do your mock preps and you kind of you build up using expired composites. Yeah. And then so you might just like layer that on and you know whatever, get a sense of that, and you can try it in the mouth. So you're always using the face as the starting point for whether or not something looks good or not mm -hmm. before you actually do it in the mouth. And it's easier for additive cases rather than subtractive, but obviously yeah. you know like the, the face is everything, right? You know like yeah. um. Yeah. So, so for me, like, yeah, like I grew into restorative and I knew, and, and in 2011, I went to the AACD um, meeting in Boston Yeah. and yeah, like I'd heard of accreditation before and I had, you know, really wanted to, I read up on it and, you know, like it's pr pretty much like the most structured um, process and the most vigorous process that one can go through mm -hmm. to kind of put yourself in cosmetic dentistry. And right now they're actually in the process of actually um, trying to, uh, I guess like, they, they've applied to the American Academy of Dental Specialties to have oh, it recognized okay. as a formal specialty. And, um, you know, I guess we'll hear the outcome of that, you know, in the years to come, um, if not months to come, but we'll see. But like I <clears throat> took the written exam with a few colleagues of mine and, you know, fortunately I passed that written exam, um, enjoyed Boston. Boston's so cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Boston's, Boston's special to me because between third and fourth year at Western, um, I did an oral surgery externship, which oh, is cool. kind of like, yeah, yeah. Roughly, roughly about a month long process. Yeah. Uh, 
And I did that at Harvard, right? Under Meredith oh, August and right. yeah. Leonard Cabin. Cabin. So um, Leonard Cabin is like the god of pediatric oral surgery. Like yeah. that guy is like the man. And the part that appeals to me the most is like cleft lip and palate repair, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, by Dr. Cabin. That was really cool because, you know, like you, you change not only how they look, but, uh, but how they how they function for life, which is which is really, really special. So, um, yeah, Boston was really cool. And then um, after that, I just went to meetings every single year, year after year. And I started to um, accumulate cases. Of course, there's five different case types. The first one is case type one, six or more porcelain veneers, global small design, meaning you, you take into account both pink and white aesthetics. Yeah. Completely. Meaning if your pink is off or if you're trying to do some crazy case and land that plane and you're just like, but look at the difficulty of this. There's no points allotted for difficulty. There's points yeah. allotted for case selection. So you got to choose the right case. So you've got to get like, you know, for example, the gingival aesthetics perfect. You got to get the dental aesthetics perfect. You got to get even the translucency. I mean, there's like, there's like 70, 80 points that you can actually fail on. And wow. any, and, and any, any, it, it's a weird grading system. I mean, like if, if, if they say, for example, you know, your contact length is too long, negative mm-hmm. two. Or if it's seriously too long, it's a major fault. That's negative four. And there's, of course, 80 80 separate points. And all you need is a negative eight or or lower, and it's over. Wow. So So you need like 73 out of 80 to pass or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and, and, and like one judge might say, oh, yeah, that's like... um, that's like the perfect polychromaticity. And the other judge might say, that's way too monochromatic. And you're like, oh, man. So it's kind of like, you know, um, yeah, like the best of the five in the room. Um, yeah. You know, like, yeah, like the majority rules, you mm-hmm. know, for that particular day. And let's hope it's your day, you know. And then, like, so I, I failed some cases. And, um, of course, as you do, and it's really humbling. And mm-hmm. through that failure, you just have to kind of, like, you know, pick yourself up and, you got to look for another case or if you think that you're confident enough to do those corrections that they recommended and resubmit the case, you can do that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then finally it culminated in an oral exam, um, which is like defending your work and why you did it. And that's in, um, in Madison, Wisconsin, which is the coldest place <laughs> yeah. in the universe, in the universe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's how does, like so you're landing and it's like ice, yeah. the lakes are frozen over. So can you talk, so what's the process? So say if so right now, like a dentist in New Zealand or in, uh, in Australia wants to go through with the whole ASCD accreditation process, does it start with attending, attending a, like a lecture and then how does it work? You just declare it and you just submit cases for consideration or is there some sort of formal CP, like CPD or CE that kind of yeah, goes through? So, uh, so pretty time? much uh, the first step, the first step is actually, um, there's a library of books on, of, of reference material mm-hmm. and journals that they recommend you read. Obviously, you can't read it all. You have to pick and choose. Um, so these are the source texts from where they will generate this, the examination questions. Um, there's also, so like, so I ordered a whole bunch of textbooks from Amazon. Yeah. You know, I was like ripping through them every morning. I used to get up at like five o'clock and I'm like, thinking, God, you know, this is so tough. But it was the only time, right? Because, you know, yeah. like there's no other time in the day. You're exhausted mm-hmm. at the end of the day. And... Um, so I get up in my robe, you know, and kind of do that. And then um, there's also sample examinations that you can that you can score as well. So some some questions are repeated, or some pa- some questions are paraphrased. Yeah. So, so it's important to get as many sample questions as possible. So you've got obviously the reference text, you've got the sample um, questions or the, or the sample examinations, and then you just go to one of the yearly meetings, like yeah. the scientific session. And then you sign up for the written exam. And then, you know, it's roughly around two to three hours long. Um, and it's a whole slew of, you know, kind of, yeah. I really miss taking those multiple choice <laughs> Um, Yeah, so it's that. And then you submit it. And then, like, you wait for the results. And then they say congratulations or whatever. And then, and then from there, you've got to um, take two kind of, like, calibration workshops one on photography, one on kind of like how to submit cases and you know, the expectations for that because they have a photographic protocol that you have to follow as well, not only from views, but also raw format mm-hmm. or NEF format or, or things like that. And um, 
you know, obviously there's no photoshopping or anything at all. Um, and then you've got to write up a report for that. And then, you know, you've got to submit it. And, you know, back then they've recently come out with a, a like a system or an interface where you can upload your cases. Okay. Yeah. Um, to, like to the website, which is much better, but I, you used to have to submit it on a stick drive or a jump drive. Mail it over. Like, <laughs> or you're that, mail that over. <laughs> But it's not as old as, for example, um, you know, back in the day they said, oh, yeah, I had to get, I had to like send in these slides for the carousel. Oh. <laughs> the carousel it's good that they're, they're keeping up with the times at least. So then, so the process is study, write the exam. And once you've written the exam, then you start submitting cases. Correct. After those two required workshops, then you start yeah. submitting cases and you have to pass each of the five case types. Mm -hmm. And then after that, then you go in for your oral examination. Yeah, and then after that, then it's really cool. It's, like, it's a, I mean, obviously, it's like a hard and lengthy process, but I think, uh, because you know, I've obviously I interview a lot of people on the podcast, and one of the themes that I try and kind of go over is you know, people who are successful where they are in their careers now, what pathway and process did they kind of go through to get there? And generally, the, the main tip that people have, like yourself, is structured learning, like you need something with structure, it's hard to kind of just pick random CPD courses here and there and just fly off for a weekend and come back and, and then have like a clear picture in mind of what can actually uh, make you successful as, as a clinician. So I think something like this is really cool because, you know, obviously you put in a lot of work for it, but it's very structured. It seems like in the process to kind of get from like A to Z. And then when you're done, you have like this massive like skill set and knowledge base that you can kind of use for the rest of your career. So I think that's really cool. I think some of that definitely uh, would be worth looking at. Uh, going forward what so what's the, what benefits do you get from it i mean outside of the knowledge base and stuff is there any some sort like is that something that they help you with like marketing or like if you have that are people aware of it like in the general population of like what a acd dentist is versus like a, just a regular dentist who's a cosmetic dentist yeah or? yeah that's a good question um so i'm working with a media company rosemont media uh from san diego and they've recently essentially restructured my website we've launched and you know the marketing strategy um, so yeah, like an AC to accredited dentist is pretty much the closest thing you can get to a specialist kind of, you know, in that particular field. Mm -hmm. And it is, um, yeah, like it, it has certainly been a real driving force for patients to my door. Um, mm -hmm. for example, recently, um, with prosthodontists and specialist restorative dentists here have actually sent, sent some, some really, really difficult, um, composite based cases. Mm -hmm. with younger individuals to my door. Yeah. Um, obviously, they didn't really want to do porcelain on them or something like that. And I was like, wow, how flattering. Um, so that's really, really good. So so definitely with composite, I mean, you're, you're seeing a lot of referrals from, from from specialists who may or may not have developed that particular area of their, of their arsenal. Yeah. Um, you know, like in terms of personal confidence and everything, of course, like, you know, like I publish quite a lot on my blog. So, um, you know, there's like content like, for <laughs> content for Africa, you know, there's like, there's, there's a lot of content. And um, of course, the more you get out there, the more um, people recognize your work and people request it. You know, it's similar to this tattoo artist that I know, his name is um, Tree at yeah. Seventh Day Studio. And, you know, um, there's people flying over from like all over the world to kind wow. of like, you know, cool. get his stuff done here. And he's like, yeah, it's the same thing. It's kind of like having a presence on there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's 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 been really, it's been really satisfying for me more so from a marketing standpoint, because at the end of the day, we're never going to be as rich as that, like that, that guy that owns that sky, that, that skyscraper yeah. or, or that, that guy that owns that law firm or, yeah. or whatever. Right. I mean, it's um, so, so, so the goal in life is not to be the richest person in the world. It's to gain contentment. Yeah. And I think, you know, like I'm not really content yet because it's not from a material standpoint. It's actually from an excellent standpoint. And I think that's, part of part of the reason why i love what i do because nature is infinite nature is beautiful nature is unattainable um it's it's perfect and you know the like the humbling thing is like you'll you'll never reach there no matter how much you try you'll never get a perfect you kick you could get really really close yeah you feel it and everything like that but you know when you analyze your work because in my study at the office i've got um this 45 inch um, LED. <laughs> so that's my monitor, up. right? Yeah. That's my monitor. And I'm literally maybe as far from maybe twice the distance of this laptop screen. Mm -hmm. So when I put up like that MOD, it's humbling, right? Yeah. Like it's humbling. You're thinking, oh, what can I improve from this? So for me, photography is actually like the conduit or the medium by which one improves the most. 
Like yeah. you've got to take exactly. photographs in order to actually see what's going on. And, and I think that's why CAD CAM and everything has been so good for a lot of dentists as well, because seeing your preps, yeah. <laughs> and rotating them is, is actually, um, it's, it's very humbling. And, and, and is actually one of the ways like, um, the, like, yeah, like the University of Michigan, that's how they teach, mm-hmm. you know, kind of that's how their preps are created yeah. <laughs> on yeah. skin. And yeah, I mean, that's. Are you looking for composite instruments that allow for exceptional non-stick placement of materials that don't discolor the restoration? Dr. Clarence Tam teamed up with Hugh Freedy to deliver you the School Tools Kit. High quality XDS composite instruments that won't flake or discolor your restorations. Hugh Freedy's XDS instruments are made from immunity steel for longer life with lightweight handles providing maximum comfort. For the listeners of the Newbie Dentist podcast, you can now receive 15% off Clarence Tam School Tool Kits by emailing events at Henry Shine, promo code Clarence. Again, that's events at henryshine.com.au, promo code Clarence for 15% off the school tool kits that we talk about in this episode. Very cool. So what, um, what advice do you have for like new, new grads or dentists who are you know, a couple years out? Um, I'm finding like myself like, talking to classmates and colleagues and stuff who are like same as me, we graduate together. A lot of people are kind of just like getting into the dumps a little bit now. Like things are getting a little bit repetitive. They're not like necessarily enjoying work as much um, or maybe like lacking that direction. Uh, so what's like your advice for like someone who's like maybe like, you know, two, three years out now, they haven't really committed to anything in terms of an aspect of general dentistry that they want to kind of dive into and, and focus on and try and get better at to make it like their thing. Um, do you have any general recommendations or tips or anything like that? Yeah, I, I'd say I always take a look at, you know, what's what stresses you, you know, like, you know, of course, boredom does, you know, and maybe like, you know, uh, routine extractions or just doing that, like, like that MO or that DO is really, really quite boring for you. So ask yourself, you know, does that, like, do I want to be better at that? Or do I actually want to do ortho? Like, maybe I really like clear correct. Maybe I really like Invisalign. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's direction that I want to take things. Or maybe I like, you know, kind of sleep dentistry or like, you know, or, or, or like, I don't know. Like there's so many different aspects of dentistry that you can get yourself into. Um, or maybe I want to specialize. But at the end of the day, you got to find what you're hungry for. Because yeah. at the end of the day, if you're not hungry for anything in dentistry, then you shouldn't do it because it is really, really stressful. Definitely. And it's got to be worth your stress. So for me, one of the things that I found, um, you know, like after accreditation or actually during accreditation, um, I started doing the COIS curriculum. You know, John COIS in yeah, Seattle? Yeah. yeah. So COIS, COIS is, yeah, like, like it's advanced general dentistry, but it's excellent in terms of providing a structured curriculum to excellence and it gives you the confidence to kind of look at cases and say oh yeah you know this isn't going to be your routine this isn't going to be your every day this is this is going to be yeah this is comprehensive treatment planning and this is how i get from point a to z Mm -hmm. and you know you can yeah and then you can integrate coices rules with digital small design rules and then all of a sudden the world's your oyster all of a sudden you're everything slots into place in terms of, whoa, you know, and then you got to say, and then you got to see whether that whoa is big enough for you to kind of continue in general dentistry or not, or whether or not you want to do something more specialized. Like maybe, maybe, um, maybe you want to do a lot more endo. Maybe you want to do, yeah, like some perio. Maybe you want to place implants, like a lot of the dentists in North America. Yeah. Right. And and that's fine. I mean, I I haven't actually, like I took a course from Nobel for placing implants back in the day, but for me, honestly, it's like I like I placed a few and I was just like, well, you know, like I think I would rather restore. Not that I don't like blood and guts, but I don't really like blood yeah. and guts. I like the like the pretty aspects of dentistry. You like your rubber dam and isolation and <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Is exactly. the um is the COIS program I mean, I've heard great things about that as well. Is that something that you're flying over for or is it just an online curriculum that you're following? Um unfortunately you gotta fly over. So yeah. Yeah, you got to like airfare it, you got to accommodation it. But you know what? There's a really cool place there that you stay called the Silver Cloud Inn. Yeah. <laughs> the Silver Cloud Inn is like right across from the campus. So you can roll out of bed super late, yeah. roll over. And Coyce is great because, you know, he knows to learn. You got to keep your mind fed, right? So mm-hmm. the guy's got this like little mini cafeteria there. And you can grab anything you want from cheese strings or cheese sticks to like um, prepackaged guacamole, <laughs> to like carrot sticks, to like bagels, to coffee, to Red Bulls. Yeah. And it's, it's great. It's, it's really wonderful. 
And how's so, that? So is it? I've heard there's like modules, like a treatment planning module. Like, um, how's how does it work for like how frequently? Yeah, you get yeah, to yeah. Uh, from from memory, uh, I think for internationals, you can do. There's like there's like nine nine courses all together, mm -hmm. and you can do one and two together. It's called the track courses. So essentially, yeah. you're speeding it up. So one and two is like treatment planning one and biomechanics one, or something like that. Um, number three is the perio restorative interface. Yeah. Um, yeah, number four is biomechanics two. I think that's four and five. Um, number six is implants. And actually six and seven, I think, are implants. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I'm on eight. So, okay, so, you've gone, on. so how many times have you had to go, go over there? Like, so you said one and two are together. Is any of the other ones together or is it just one-offs that you go there's off? Some, there's some that are not able to be paired together. So yeah. like I think the last one I went to was, 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 six, was six and seven or... I can't remember. I, I think I've been over a total of four or five times. Yeah. Okay. A total so of four or five times. You got to investigate. Yeah. You got to dovetail it in with a, with a trip to visit your folks. Otherwise they're not going to love you anymore. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> how, how long is the, how long is like one and two, for example, is it like a week or? It's a week. Yeah. It's a week. So each, yeah. each uh, course per se is kind of three days. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Three days. And there is something called boat night. Boat night is, you know, when you go on this giant yacht, so Kois, obviously, he's rich, right? <laughs> but the guy, he's rich. And he's got yeah. this yacht called Excellence. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's got a sub-zero fridge. It's got, it's got, it's, it's, a, it's a nicer house than most land-based houses. Yeah. <laughs> um, you've seen the engine room. It's just amazing. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's, you look at the size of that engine and whatever, it's hard for him not to make another child. You know what I mean? Because it's like, you know, it's, it's like really that sexy. Yeah. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful boat and it's got so many different corners or nooks for chilling. You know, yeah. it's a, uh, it's, 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 he's living the dream, that guy. Yeah. He really is. You got to wear slippers when you're on board. You got to wear the slippers. Because, really? You know, you... <laughs> yeah, or yacht hat as well. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. And he's got yeah. a jacuzzi on the top, you oh, know? Man. And it's just like, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. So it's worth the trip out then. <laughs> it, it is absolutely. Because you get to know like him. And, and, yeah. and he's such a humble guy. Mm -hmm. He's such a humble teacher, but he's such a master at what he does. Yeah. And he's so effortless. And I love his accent because it's like, uh, it's like Pacino, right? From New York. <laughs> yeah. It's like he's, he's, he's in Seattle, but he's a New Yorker. You know? Yeah. Okay, that's pretty cool. And I guess it's, it's helpful that it's in Seattle on the West Coast a little bit. It's a little bit uh, shorter flight and stuff from, uh, from, Moscow, exactly. from, from Australia. Yes, yeah. Um, so yeah, I had a, for yeah. sure. I had another young dentist uh, from Sydney, Dr. Aiden, and he went to it as well. He said great things. So um, I think that's, uh, I think it's time to kind of uh, invest in that and head over as well and kind of check it out. Great, great idea. What's in the, so talk, t tell me a little bit about the sculpting school that you run in, in New Zealand. Like when did you start that and how, what's the plans for the future for that one? Yeah. Sculpting school happened a few years ago. Um, I thought that, you know, I might obviously start doing workshops. I, I, I figured for myself, the easiest way to learn, the best way to learn was not through lectures. You can like, you know, hear people and you might, yeah, say, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to try mm -hmm. that. I'm going to try that. But until you actually do it. Yeah. It doesn't actually lock in the place and you know like what what what's your idea just like you know when you read a novel you know the picture that you have in your head as 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 the villain comes towards you is different from the picture in my head and stuff like that so it's a way to kind of like you know calibrate that and kind of like equilibrate that so um workshops are the best way because it's over the shoulder one-on-one -on -one tuition i try to keep courses to a max of 19 or 20 individuals because mm -hmm. If it becomes too big. It becomes a super class and you're not actually going around. You're just trying to get through the day, you know, yeah. and then people might as well just watch you do stuff on a video. Mm -hmm. but the goal is not so much how you can do how, what you do at the front, right? It's actually how much time you spend with the delegates because that is actually, you know, so, oh no, that's do this a little bit differently. And I've seen some outstanding results. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like it's important for me to always get up and kind of go around at every, almost every step. It's like, you know, for example, you know, let's, let's roll your putty matrix. Let's put it on. Um, have you captured that facial and size align angle? Let me see. Mm -hmm. stuff, oh no, that's what the, this is how we're going to correct it. Or, you know, we're going to do it again, but we're going to try this and then stuff like that. So it's like those tiny little things that'll make your, like your Monday morning that much easier when you try it for the first time. So yeah. Yeah, it's it's um, sculpting school started a few years ago, and you know it's uh, it was primarily New Zealand and Australia, and yeah. of course, you know, 
Um, but but now it's kind of expanding to North America. Um, nice. I've got I've got Portland, Oregon lined up, uh, which is south of Seattle, and that's yeah. um, I think in August. And also like the Nordic tour, so like kind of like Finland, uh, Norway, Sweden. Oh, it's awesome! So you're taking it on, yeah. taking the show on the road. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. So that that's gonna be in November sometime. So I'll mm-hmm. spend my birthday kind of over where it's really cold. Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> um, so, so, so yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's great. Of course, like, you know, anterior layering, like everyone does it, you know, to be honest, you can look on YouTube and everyone layers kind of like similar, but different, but similar, but posteriors mm-hmm. is where not a lot of people know how to do that, you know? Yeah. And it's kind of yeah. like, and I kind of taught myself, I didn't actually learn from anyone in particular. So um, it's really a joy to be, yeah, to be able to share that with like everyone. So yeah yeah so is that course uh, how often do you like to come do you come to australia at all to do it like do you have any plans to do that in australia yeah yeah like i've i've done it um most recently for for perth okay uh, perth yeah. in february actually this year um it was a two-day back-to-back course day one mm-hmm. was posterior sculpting school 101 yeah. uh, day two was anterior sculpting school 102 mm-hmm. and of course there's 103 as well which is prep school prep school yeah. is kind of like a guide to designing adhesive and cohesive based indirect restorations okay, and nice. then um and then sculpting school 104 is kind of like you know bonding versus cementation how do you do it when should you do it mm-hmm. etc cetera, etc cetera. and then also there's kind of a in- injectable composite type of a module as well that i'm working on currently so i mean it's um yeah the, i am doing it in sydney um i think mid-year Okay, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and in Sydney mid-year. And um, again, it's kind of like the two courses back to back. And I don't know, the, I don't have the dates off the top, but you can definitely contact the ADA MSW. Yeah. And yeah, yeah definitely get amongst it. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. So I'll put the, uh, I'll put the link in the show notes as well if anyone's listening and interested in kind of checking it out. Um, I think sure. it'd, be a, it'd be a great resource. So what about like in your, in your practicing life, uh, what's your plans for the future there? Yeah, well, Currently, um, I just want to say something about like sculpting school, sure. the workshops, but also I, I, I had the opportunity to develop a custom instrument kit with Hugh Freedy. Oh, really? Of course, nice. we all, yeah, like we all love Hugh Freedy yeah. and everything. Like that. So the kit is a very streamlined kit. Um, and I can send you the link to those, or That'd I can actually get Hugh Freedy to contact you actually directly with all the information. That'd be great. And yeah. it is a streamlined kit that'll essentially give you the ability to simply knock restorations out of the park. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's this one instrument that looks like this aggressive Eagle's talon that'll just like inject sex appeal into like almost every restoration. I mean, yeah, you can use it for, yeah, I'm I'm totally selling it. Um, I don't actually get a kickback at all from them, but it's called school tools. Yeah. And um, yeah, the, the, yeah, it's, it's really attractively colored for females and metrosexuals. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Yeah, you know, like where's that dark? Blue? There is a dark blue. Yeah, you just have to look for it. It's okay. more like pastel. You know what yeah. I mean? It's yeah. more like pastel. Depends on the yeah. lighting, maybe. It depends on the lighting. Yeah, yeah it depends on your mood. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, um, so, so my plans for the future, obviously, um, you know, yes, like I do. Like I've got, I've got a practice in New Market, and I last year in June I bought a practice in Devonport, mm-hmm. which is like a super kind of wealthy older hippie suburb of Auckland. Mm-hmm. It's like kind of like old school British colonial, like old money and stuff. Yeah. Um, like people in Devonport, if you jaywalked, they might look at you funny. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, like on their Facebook page, they'll have stuff like someone left their bike at the corner of this road and this road. I almost tripped and killed myself. <laughs> look at or something. I'm like, whoa, you yeah. know, <laughs> people riding into the ferry terminal again, you know, mm-hmm you know, scaring disabled people or something like that. And then she, they say, you be, yeah, you should be ashamed of yourself. You know, mm-hmm. I'm keeping my eye out for you. Look at this one. Look at this one. They take shots of it and people are like, don't you have anything better to do with your time? Yeah. Yeah, and then things like that. So Devonport. Yeah. So I don't work in Devonport, but it's a pretty practice. Meaning yeah. it's um, like, I, I did it up like, um, like my dream practice kind of mm-hmm. new market is old school, right? Like, you know, just like your favorite restaurant and um, wait, like in Melbourne, I love Vietnamese food, right? Yeah. So my friends in Melbourne, they bring me to like, it's either Richmond, right? Or there's yeah. like, um, I can't remember the other one, but it's like old school Vietnamese, like yeah, 
Chinatown or Vietnam town. And it's like the original branch of this restaurant that I love looks horrible, right? Mm-hmm. looks horrible. But that's where it all came from. Yeah. So, so Newmarket's kind of old school. Like my rooms are obviously really pretty, but you know, like the building and like the, like the, the staircase and even like the reception area, tiny a little bit because it's, um, I have two other dentists that I actually share that space with. Yeah. So it's like Newmarket's first group practice ever. Yeah. Um, so that's Newmarket. Devonport's like, you know, completely, yeah, completely my own. Um, but I don't work there. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> because I've had the problem where if I'm trying to kind of um, give work to an associate, there's mm-hmm. some patients, There's most of my patients will not want to at all. Yeah. So I figured, you know, if I have a practice um, in Devonport, I'm not even there, then they don't have a choice. Mm-hmm. Then essentially it's, a, you know, like it's a practice where they don't know me really, except by my name on the door. Okay, so, interesting. So you're, yeah, you're yeah. using the brand to kind of grow things now. Um, yeah, yeah. So do you have no plans of practicing there? It's just like sort of like a like an investment thing that you've done. Yeah, I mean, like I might do the odd case or consult there or something like that. But mm-hmm. I'm a cr- I'm a creature of habit. I like to, you know, like stay in my own room and do my own thing. You yeah. Know? I mean, as as much as I changed from Toronto to Auckland, I, I don't really like change. You yeah. know, so so hence, you know, um, like I. I really like Melbourne though. So given the opportunity, I would probably mm-hmm. like I would open a practice in Melbourne. Yeah. Just cause I really do love the city that it's much. A great city. Yeah. We, I just it's went to, uh, I just went to Sydney yesterday for a Invisalign course and like, it's a, it's a big city. So you kind of feel like you're in like in Toronto or something, but like, it's not the same at all. Like it doesn't have the same soul or like culture or anything. Like Melbourne's exactly. like a pretty, pretty cool place to be. Yeah. So which suburb do you live in in Melbourne? Uh, in Camberwell, so it's like southeast. Oh, okay. Like near, like South Yarra, like maybe like twenty, like fifteen minutes, uh, like down the road, like ten minutes down the road from South Yarra. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's nice, okay, like, awesome. nice, nice, yeah, leafy, okay. uh, It's like a pretty older, it's like an older suburb. There's not many like young people, but uh, it's nice and quiet, I guess. <laughs> okay. Is that close to Peran? Peran? Ah, uh, yeah, not too, like ten minutes from there. Yeah. Pran. Am I saying it right? Pran is it Pran? Pran? Pran, yeah. So <laughs> I can't even say it. I mean, I'm not a true uh, Melbourneian, but um, yeah, I think it's Pran. <laughs> Pran. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Okay, perfect. Thanks a lot for uh, coming on. I like to just kind of wrap things up with a quick rapid fire, just uh, light and easy. Uh, so yeah. what's your uh, what's your favorite pizza topping? Ooh, moz- mozzarella. Mozzarella. <laughs> mozzarella. Uh, yeah. What's, uh, what's your favorite like band or uh, artist or group? Uh, unfortunately, it's trance. So, like Gareth Emery. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah random. Do you listen to trance at work, or what's like your work music? Oh, not at work. At work, I listen to like you know lo-fi or chill hop. Yeah, that's great. I love that yeah. too. What's your favorite tooth to work on? Wow, holy one six. One six. Yeah, that's a common <laughs> answer actually. <laughs> huh? That's a common answer actually. <laughs> Is it really? uh, What's uh what's what's like one procedure in dentistry that makes you question your career choice? Um, I would probably say release of phrenectomies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's if you weren't in dentistry, what career would you be in? Plastic surgery, hands Plastic down. Plastic surgery, yeah. Yeah, guaranteed. Okay. Perfect. Uh, Dr. Tam, thanks for coming on the podcast. Uh, it was a pleasure to kind of, you know, go along your journey with you and sort of learn, you know, where you started off and sort of where you've come now and where you're going to head into the future. I think, th- you know, some of the big takeaways from this podcast are definitely the structure of learning. I know I, I do this podcast, obviously, a lot of it is selfish reasons just to get access to people that I want to talk to and then learn from them, put it out there for other people to kind of get, get the same benefit. That's good. Um, it's a good conduit. I really applaud what you're doing, Dr. Zemi. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. But it's, I think the structure of learning is cool. I think that's something that I've, I need to kind of get onto now because I've been, you know, like any new grad, you kind of, one is you don't, you don't have enough money yet to like invest like 30 grand into a big program exactly. or course or something. But I think it's getting to that point now where you just kind of, Either you're just going to be a like general dentist and like be very basic and just do fillings and cleans and whatever. But if you want to actually go somewhere in your career, you, you got to like invest heavy and like, like move on from like the dental school dentistry, as they say, and learn the most like advanced procedures and then kind of go from there. So uh, I think that's something that's really admirable. And I, I'll, if you can send me some details, if you have any about the AACD process or course, um, and that Hugh Freedy uh, set as well. Well, I'll definitely get on the show notes for other people to kind of check it out as well. Yeah, that'd be really, really cool. I can definitely do that. Yeah, just just remember, no matter what, to always back yourself and um, surround yourself with the with the type of people that you 
aspire to learn from or want to be like and everything like that. And I think, um, yeah, like that same, that same saying, like when you choose friends in high school, you know, yeah. remind yourself <laughs> with like the type true. of friends that you want to be, you yeah. know, and then, um, yeah, because if not, you'll be like, oh man, I'm pregnant or whatever, I mean, which, <laughs> is fine, which is fine for like, those people that were destined to be mothers, but yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a good note to wrap on there. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs>